that wonderful introduction. <laughs> Again, I'm Damon Williams, Director of Diversity, Community, and Recruitment. Many of you I've had the pleasure of meeting over the last two days, and I look forward to meeting several other faces that I haven't had the opportunity. So please don't be shy. Please reach out. Please say hello. Students, haven't we had an awesome day? Let's say that again and make sure you're awake. <laughs> we started early this morning. Around, even though I saw some of you in the lobby around 2 a.m., I said, what's going on? But we started around 9 a.m. with remarks from our keynote speaker who talked about what to do with a PhD, other pathways, right? And he gave us some key nuggets. And some of those nuggets were to treat ourselves as a business, do we remember that? And to question and know the why. Why is it that we do the research that we do? Why is it that we want to study what we want to study? Why is it that we are interested in our particular graduate programs? We followed up, and I'll piggyback off Dr. Morgan's comments with oral and poster presentations. You all did a great job. You know, we, we hear stories, we read articles about minorities in STEM. Look around the room. They're right here. So, you know, next time you hear some of those remarks, you say, I participated in a STEM symposium where I saw over 100 students participating in research and presenting research. And I myself presented research. So, you know, you're here to squash the myth. One of the most enjoying things that I enjoyed today was seeing you all network. Dean Johnson and myself last night said, network, network, network. And today at lunch, you had the opportunity of networking with program directors, faculty, and graduate students. Remember I said last night that I'm the spokesperson. I'm the champion. I'm the cheerleader for the Laney Graduate School. But the graduate students will give you the 411 and all the good stuff. But you have the opportunity, you have the opportunity tonight. So definitely take advantage of our graduate students that are in the room. So with all of that, we're just getting started. So before we move to our speaker, let's give yourself a round of applause. So last night at the opening reception, I mentioned Dr. Michael Lomax that you would hear from him. So you're in for a treat. This is really an aha moment for me because just as you're sitting in these chairs, I won't tell you how many years ago because then I will reveal my true age, but I was a student like yourself sitting at Dillard University when Dr. Lomax was the president of Dillard University and I was a student. So I'm an example of if you really work hard, then you have the opportunity to get dressed up and come introduce keynote speakers. <laughs> So it's my distinct pleasure, um, since 2004, Dr. Michael Lomax has been the president and CEO of the United Negro College Fund, the nation's largest, largest private provider of scholarships and educational support for African Americans. Under his leadership, UNCF has raised more than $2.3 billion. Let's say that again. UNCF has raised more than $2.3 billion. I think he deserves a round of applause for that. <laughs> Helping more than 92,000 students earn college degrees and launch careers. I gave you the, the, the quick story last night that I was a UNCF recipient at UNCF Institution Xavier University. So again, this means a lot to me. Annually, UNCF works, works and enables 60,000 students to go to college with UNCF scholarship and attend its 37 member historical black colleges and universities. Before coming to UNCF, Lomax was president of the UNCF member institution Dillard University and a literature professor at Morehouse and Spelman Colleges. We have some students from those institutions today in the room. He serves on the board of directors for Teach for America, the Kip Foundation, the Smithsonian's Institution Museum of African American History and Culture, and the Studio Museum of Harlem. He founded the National Black Arts Festival here in Atlanta. In June 2016, he was named in Savoy's magazines as 300 most influential, inf influential black corporate directors. 
And we're proud to say that Dr. Lomax is an alum of the Laney Graduate School. So he's our very own. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Michael Lomax. Thank you, Damon. Let's give Damon a big hand. He worked hard. It's good to be back at Emory. And good to be with all of you. You all look very smart. I hope you're enjoying your dessert. I didn't get to eat all of mine. That's what happens when you're the speaker, you know? It's like, what am I? Worthy of a little piece of chocolate cake? Uh, I'm glad to be here. I've actually been at Emory uh, a lot recently. Uh, we had a session here for a group of 100 of our scholars, uh, one of whom is with us this evening. I'll introduce her uh, in, a, in a few moments. Um, you know, I'm, it's amazing what happens if you're going to graduate or undergraduate these days. You get treated so well. Put you up in a hotel, you know, and feed you chicken. You know, it's, they, they're concerned about whether you're a vegan or, you know, vegetarian or lactose intolerant or, you know, whatever. And uh, they're so nice to you. And uh, you think they really mean it? <laughs> I just, it, it, actually, it, it's wonderful to see this program. And I, it makes me think about uh, my early experiences, both as an undergraduate, a graduate, I'm sort of talking while you finish you know, serving, and, that's, and then I'll get into the actual speech. But, um, and in 1964, when I started college, at the time your grandparents started college, uh, uh, I went to Morehouse, which is not very far from here. Uh, let's, ha let's hear it from Morehouse. Spent a lot of time at Spelman. Let's hear it for Spelman. Uh, and, uh, but Atlanta was a very different community. And so to come here this evening and to be a part of a program where Emory is really intentionally reaching out to communities that haven't been as represented on the campus is such a big change from the way it was back in 1964. 64 was the first year that an African American attended Emory as an undergraduate. First year. And I knew that guy, Arthur Richardson. We called him Rat. Horrible nickname. <laughs> But he lived here in, uh, in Atlanta, and his parents were both uh, <coughs> high school math teachers. And you know, then when you chose people to be the first to integrate, you know, always very careful in selecting to get somebody who would uh, do well. And uh, unlike the students who were the first to go to the University of Georgia, Charlene, Hunter, Galt, and Hamilton Holmes, Emory was a fairly uh, warm and embracing community, for our, or at least a, a tolerant community for Arthur, who came here. And I remember that as a student over at Morehouse, uh, we used to have gatherings at the uh, Canterbury House, which was the uh, off-campus facility of the uh, Episcopalian Church. I'm not Episcopalian, but it was an opportunity to meet with students from other campuses which meant they were opportunities for black and white students to get together. And so a couple of girls would come over from uh, Agnes Scott and some students from Emory and some students from uh, Georgia Tech, and we would all sit around and have meaningful conversations about uh, going to college and realize that you know we were all similar, uh, but they were very, very uptight experiences. And then, uh, I graduated from Morehouse and went on to Columbia University for my master's degree in 16th century English literature, so if anybody wants to know about that, uh, I've got a lot to say. And, uh, and then uh, was about to be drafted into the Vietnam War 
not wanting to go to Canada, uh, I decided to teach at Morehouse, which was uh, something that would give me an occupational deferment. And uh, so I taught there until the war ended. And then in 1971, I was, had to make a big decision about whether I'd return to Columbia or go to Berkeley where I could go study African American literature. I had abandoned 16th century English literature at that point, or Dartmouth, or come to Emory. And I chose to come to Emory. And uh, I will tell you, there were no occasions like this uh, for, for people going to uh, PhD programs at Emory. You were admitted, got a healthy fellowship, happily, uh, and then you were on your own. And it was, you know, a, you know it was a survival of the fittest. It was uh, social Darwinism at its best, you know. You either make it or you don't, and if you don't make it, you weren't meant to make it. And, um, and happily, I made it and got my PhD from Emory, and, uh, uh, but didn't pursue a teaching career. And I want to talk a little bit about the paths that I think you all will have to consider. Um, so we're almost through with the servers. And let's give the servers a big hand, because they've done a great job. Um, the other thing about Emory, uh, I would note, back in 1971, when I was uh, starting here, was it wasn't much more diverse than it was for Arthur Richardson. Very few African-American students. Very few other students. I mean, it wasn't that you come on the Emory campus today and you see, I'm amazed. I mean, it's like a little United Nations. Uh, you see people from all over uh, the world wearing their national identities uh, very proudly. And Emory has really been on an incredible journey over the last half century, I think, to lean into and embrace uh, being a community of scholars and students who uh, are not threatened, but in, do indeed embrace uh, people of difference and different backgrounds. That doesn't mean that uh, there aren't obstacles and there aren't barriers, but I think it says a lot that Emory is really reaching out and saying to all of you, uh, Many of you who are, you know, um, uh, from backgrounds that don't often get an opportunity to go to graduate and professional school, um, African American, Latino, uh, Asian, Native American, uh, women, a lot of women here, uh, although I might note women are increasingly uh, pursuing advanced degrees and women of color particularly very aggressively pursuing advanced degrees because, because women, I think, recognize in ways, and certainly women of color recognize because they have multiple obstacles to overcome, that um, demonstrating intellectual capability uh, is an opportunity to level that playing field. Maybe not completely. But I think women get it. I wish more guys got it. I wish more black men, more Latino men got it. Because it's so important to be pursuing advanced education in the 21st century. So, you know, it's the usual assignment. I'm getting ready to start reading my speech now. Oh boy. I'm going to try to look up. It's hard to do this, but I had, there are some things I really wanted to say to you this evening about why I think it's so important for you to be here that I did what I don't normally do, and that is put on paper my remarks. So I hope you'll bear with me because I don't want to, to miss saying some of the things that I think it's important to say to a group of very bright, very hardworking young scholars who are at a um, fork in the road, a point where you've got to make a decision. You know, you've got to make some choices. And um, 
And I think most of you are being something that I don't think enough young people are, that is you're being very intentional about this, you're being strategic, you're weighing. Now that doesn't mean you won't make a mistake or uh, you know, that you'll weigh them all right, but you're doing something, you're taking control of your destiny to the extent that you can. Um, so it's usual assignment for a keynote speaker like me speaking to an audience of future scholars like you to try to inspire you as you prepare to embark on the next leg of your journey through life. As Dr. Seuss would say, oh, the places you'll go. <laughs> but here today, our roles are reversed. I am really inspired by you, by the time at which your coming of educational and professional age, by the challenges the world has laid out before you, and by the opportunities for you to achieve, to serve, and to make a difference in the world. The number and breadth of opportunities open to you is only multiplied by the fact that you are majoring in STEM disciplines, the areas of knowledge that are fueling the 21st century information age and innovation-based economy. And the fact that you are STEM students, many of whom are of color, in a country rapidly trending majority-minority heightens the value that you will bring to your profession or your employer or to your own business enterprise and heightens the service you can render to a multiracial, multi-ethnic world. Now, I want to just tell you in advance because talking about money is often considered vulgar in academic settings that I'm going to emphasize among all your choices the choice of becoming rich. And I know most of you never would like to do that. <laughs> and, but I want to particularly underscore that here because Wealth in the 21st century is increasingly being produced by intellect, by knowledge, by the kinds of work that you're learning to do. Um, my seatmate at dinner said, well, you must spend a lot of time having dinner with very rich people. <laughs> it's hard to raise $2 billion from people who aren't very rich. Uh, and many of those people I meet with are people from um, inherit, who, have, who have inherited wealth. Um, but the vast majority of the people that I deal with are people who have made their wealth themselves. And increasingly, they are people who wealth came from bringing to life their own ideas. Bill Gates. Reed Hastings, Netflix. Um, Carrie Walton. Oh. She didn't make it because her grandfather did. <laughs> uh, a man I'm going to talk about, Robert F. Smith, who last year gave $47, $48 million to the United Negro College Fund, largest gift we've received from an African American, an engineer with an MBA. Brain power that led to wealth, and wealth is not to be sneezed at. <coughs> because communities of color need to build more wealth. 
African American community is one of the least wealthy communities in America. We're not going to get there one good job at a time. We're going to get there with some billionaires and some millionaires. And we're going to get more of them because they're going to have ex big ideas and they're going to know how to bring them to life. So wealth is very important. Think about the communities that you come from and the experiences that are limited in those communities because of poverty. And one other thing that wealth enables you to do is not to just be the rising tide that lifts all boats or be a part of that, but also to give back. Because philanthropy is so important. And we can all be philanthropists. I write my checks, but I'm not a high impact philanthropist. Robert Smith is a high impact philanthropist. He can laser focus his investment on things. And I'm going to talk about how he is laser focusing his investment on STEM scholars. Because he sees that as not only good for them, but good for the communities from which they come. So what a great time to be a college STEM senior. But the very breadth and depth of the opportunities you face bring a range of choices you will need to make. And as I said earlier, to live is to make choices. And this kind of choice, the choice of what direction your education ought to take from here, the kind of profession toward which you want to aim as you launch your career, will be one of your most important decisions. You'll notice that what I just said assumes, to some extent, that your education will not end with your graduation from college. And that assumption is intentional. Challenging yourself to pursue an undergraduate degree in STEM, the time and the treasure that you and your family have invested to get you to this point is a great accomplishment in and of itself and a big risk. How many of you got loans? You don't be embarrassed. That's risk. But you believed enough in yourself, right, to take the chance. The chance of giving you potential for professional achievement and financial success well beyond those open to students whose education ended with a high school diploma for sure, or even a non-STEM degree. One of your senior colleagues back at your home institution who majored in English like me, uh, which does not have the same value in the marketplace as a STEM bachelor's degree. But in the time in which we live, success of almost any form requires more and more specialized knowledge and understanding than a bachelor's degree alone typically imparts. So an increasing number of jobs in the fastest growing and best paying career paths now require, or at least <coughs> prefer, not only a bachelor's degree, but an advanced credential, an MD, an MBA, a doctoral degree, or some combination thereof, which gives you a special insight and set of skills to pursue your dream. And so you have another choice. If you opt to continue your education, as I hope you will, toward what destination should your graduate education take you? You know, for generations in minority communities, a scientific bent and a degree in science have often, but not always, as I suggest, will suggest in a moment, led to a career in either medicine, dentistry, pharmacy, or teaching. And if you were a, a woman of color, or just a woman with a scientific bent, those were, I mean, pharmacy, nursing, you know, 
That's where you would take that capability. And no members of our community were or are still today more important or more respected than those of a doctor, a dentist, a teacher, a pharmacist, a nurse. They're highly regarded professions. But as the recipient of a PhD from Emory, my mission today is to urge you to consider the exciting opportunities that a graduate degree from Emory's Laney School, graduate school, opens up to you. Opportunities not only to achieve and to serve, but to innovate, to explore, to create. And opportunities to shape the next generation of innovators, to pursue research that will make life better and longer here in the US and around the world and to teach the next generation of STEM scientists. And I know you're already thinking about that. I met a student senior at Morehouse. I always try to find them. And you know he's already you know, looking at his career in epidemiology and policy in developing nations and is going to go do the Peace Corps. And, and I mean, I mean, I was never that focused. I was, will it be 16th century or 18th century? <laughs> <laughs> and today, an advanced STEM degree can also be the foundation for creating business ventures that will produce great wealth and enable the innovative entrepreneurs to create wealth within the minority and women-owned business communities that enable philanthropy that will support the education dreams and aspirations <coughs> of young people like you or do other important things that you think need to be done that only can be done with great wealth. You know, it used to be in this country that you would say if you're going to have great wealth, you either have to get, you know, you, you've got to be in business or somebody's, you know, has to help you do it. But now, big ideas, inventions, innovation and creativity are much more accessible. But the foundation is knowledge. The foundation is learning and the ability to keep learning and to pursue the things that you believe you want to find out. The breadth of opportunities is to some extent a function of the vast expansion of opportunities for women and people of color across the country compared to when I was at this stage of life that you are now. Yes, there are still obstacles and gender and racial and other barriers that, will, that you will face. But the opportunities are way greater than ever before for highly educated and innovative <coughs> STEM scholars who are black or brown or women or come from backgrounds where the professor at a university but not Emory will still say, this isn't meant for you. And I suspect some of you in this audience have still heard that. I know I talk to students who are or recent graduates in Silicon Valley and elsewhere, and they pursued a degree and they've, they've gotten that big engineering job at uh, Apple or at, at one of the other big companies. And I say, what did the, your professor say to you? And the numbers of them who said, this isn't for you, was still shocking. I'm thinking of people like Dr. Robert J. Gilliard, Jr., a chemistry PhD from the University of Georgia and an alumnus of the UNCF Merck Science Initiative. One of the programs offered by the, the organization I head that you know about, the United Negro College Fund, to help create STEM opportunities for the 21st century. Dr. Gilliard was one of a select group of young American scientists chosen to represent the United States at the 63rd Nobel Laureate meeting in Lindau, Germany, a global forum that aims to educate, inspire, and connect the world's best talent. And he has been recognized by Forbes magazine as one of Forbes's 30 under 30 
in science as one of the brightest young entrepreneurs, breakout talents, and change agents. Two decades ago, three decades ago, he'd have been invisible. Today, his intellectual and scholarly pursuits make him highly visible and highly sought after. And I'm thinking of Dr. Rob Carl Pendergrass, another UNCF Merck alumnus who earned his PhD in physiology and pharmacology from Wake Forest University School of Medicine, went on to conduct his postdoctoral research under the guidance of Dr. Michael E. Davis in the Division of Cardiology at Emory University School of Medicine and Department of Biomedical Engineering at Emory University in Georgia Tech, and now serves as the Director of Medical Affairs for the Cardiovascular Metabolic Disease Team at Merck. The color of his skin isn't an obstacle if he's got it up there. <coughs> I'm thinking, for example, of Dr. Tony Coles, who went from a career as a doctor to become CEO of Onyx Pharmaceuticals, a producer of cancer drugs, and, and after Onyx was sold to Amgen, joined with a partner to invest part of the $10 billion he received from the sale to start heading a newly formed company called Humanity Therapeutics, committed to treatment of, for Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and ALS, or Lou Gehrig's disease. I've gotten to know Tony through our joint service on the board of the National Museum of African American History and Culture, and I am proud to see him using part of his now great wealth to help build the first Smithsonian Museum dedicated to African American history and culture that will be an inspiration to everyone to see how people overcome obstacles to achieve big dreams. In 20 years, for example, the UNCF Merck Science Initiative has helped more than 750 African American undergraduate, graduate, and postdoctoral students, including Dr. Brown, study for careers as researchers and scholars in the biomedical sciences and engineering. And you want to talk about a smart group of folks when you get those together and you're sitting around there with those MD, PhDs. They're a lot older because it just takes, I guess, a lot longer. <laughs> um, but how impressive because they're so counter the stereotype of who they would, should be and what they should be doing. Some of these Merck scholars are medical doctors as well, but the vast majority are research scientists with PhDs. Why do so many first generation STEM students of color choose doc medicine? Well, you, somebody said? I said that's all they see. That's all they see. And most often, that's all their parents and family members who have sacrificed so much for them to get to that stage see. And they think it's a big C. But you have the opportunity now to see beyond those limitations and to see that your brain, your willingness to work hard to pursue excellence in your scientific field doesn't open a laser set of opportunities. It opens a panorama. And the more you know, the more you know the most about something that nobody else knows something about, in some ways, the bigger your opportunity. And just last year, we launched the Fund 2 Foundation UNCF STEM Scholars Program, which I've mentioned, a $48 million initiative that will help 1,000 highly motivated and academically talented African American high school students who are committed to pursuing STEM degrees in college. And Fund 2 Foundation is the brainchild 
of African-American entrepreneur and now philanthropist Robert F. Smith, who, by the way, holds an engineering degree from Cornell and an MBA from Columbia. His wealth is the result of deep STEM knowledge and entrepreneurial mindset and a steely personality which have enabled him to pursue business enterprises uh, with a passion and an insight that no one else has. Um, and he is today now making a name for himself not only as a manager of large funds but as someone who gives back as the chairman of the board of Carnegie Hall, as the largest single donor to, uh, one of the largest donors to the new museum and the largest African American donor in the history of UNCF to our work. We held our first STEM scholars orientation right here, right here in this room at Emory in July where the students converged to map out academic and career goals and they heard from African American experts within the STEM fields. But they also learned that they will be given exposure to entrepreneurship and business so they have the option of creating STEM ventures that will build wealth and do good at the same time. I'm excited to have with us tonight one of our inaugural Fund 2 Foundation UNCF STEM scholars, Adenke Ola Beggy. There she is. Adenke. is a freshman, they still call him freshman, right? First year student uh, at Emory, pursuing a degree in science with future plans to create a biomedical instrument company that produces life-saving medical supplies and devices. She also has long-term goals of leading a nonprofit international organization that helps other people in health field, particularly in developing countries. So already you can see that she is developing an entrepreneurial and a philanthropic mindset. So she better do very well here as a STEM <laughs> scholar because otherwise she's not going to be able to bring to life all of those big entrepreneurial and philanthropic dreams. Let's all stand behind her. You know, today's opportunities are also a function of the scientific and social moment in which we find ourselves. Scientific discovery has always been important in the world's, to the world's well-being, but never before have the challenges we face loomed so large among our collective hopes and fears. Never before have these challenges appeared so often, not only in the news, on the front pages and in the headlines, and never have so many across the country, around the world, and in so many families needed the better lives that science can bring. Never have so many needed better treatments, even cures for Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or for a range of cancers. Never have we so needed to harden the evidence for climate change. Just think about those of you who will be pursuing you know, advanced knowledge in the areas of climate change. I was listening to a program this afternoon on the radio about how climate change is going to have more palpable impact on our lives than the internet even had. And just think about, you know, if you'd known about the internet 20 years before uh, Al Gore did, you too could have created enterprises that would, you know, both address the information sharing, but also could have been enterprises that could have benefited from it. Think how much we're going to need enterprises that are going to address climate change. And think how those enterprises are going to be the businesses of the 21st and the 22nd century. All of these grand challenges facing humanity require great thinkers, innovators, and entrepreneurs, scholars, who stretch the boundaries of human knowledge and imagination to discover new truths about how our bodies work and how the universe is constructed. And precisely because science now looms so large in all our lives, 
Never have we needed the excellent teachers of science at every level, professors at the university who will educate the teachers, who will do for millions more people, and especially for millions more young women around the world and people of color, introduce them to science and cultivate their interest and their knowledge the way your teachers introduced you to science and cultivated your interest. And because we know that students of color are much more likely to be drawn to the study of science when they are taught by faculty of color, a group that is in short supply at many non-HBCUs, never have we so badly needed scholars of color to teach and to mentor. There's a great opportunity here at Emory which has made great strides and at other institutions to increase the number of faculty of color and women in the STEM disciplines. You have that opportunity. All of which is a way of saying that never before have we needed to attract scientific discovery and to the education of the next generation of scientists, our smartest, most ambitious, and most innovative young minds. Never before, in other words, have we so urgently needed people like you. I am urging you to follow this path of education into graduate school, not only because I think you will find it more rewarding than other career paths, although I think you will find it more rewarding, but also because in doing so, you will be paying back the women scientific pioneers and scientific pioneers of color on whose shoulders all of you stand. And you will pay forward those who will follow in your footsteps. I don't doubt that as you have pursued your educational and professional aspirations, you have encountered obstacles. Some related to the fact that you are women or students of color or that you are low income or that you don't come from privileged backgrounds. But I also do not doubt that you know that previous generations were confronted with even more formidable obstacles. There was a time, I'm sure you know, when enslaved African Americans were forbidden to learn to read and write, and a time when the institutions we now know as historically black colleges and universities were formed to give them the education that they needed a century and a half ago. Just this month, the New York Times told the story of African American women now in their 70s, 80s, and even 90s, who, as the Times put it, and I quote, worked at NASA as mathematicians, often under Jim Crow laws, calculating crucial trajectories for rockets while being segregated from their white counterparts. How many of you knew in the 50s and 40s there were black women back there making those calculations? How many of you knew that during World War II there were women at Betchley Park helping to create the first, they call them Enigma machines, which were the precursors from, uh, for uh, computers. The role of women, white and women of color, has just been, well, erased from so much of the history we know. And it's not only unfair to them, it takes away the role models that would be inspiring generations of women today. Finally, decades after their service to the country, that story is being told in a new book called Hidden Figures, Order It, Read It, by Margot Lee Shetterly. And if you don't like to read books, which I can't imagine is the case, uh, go see uh, the new movie that's coming out starring <laughs> Taraji P. Henson. Now, I'm, I'm having a hard time wrapping my brain around her moving from Empire to, uh, <laughs> to NASA. Uh, Octavia Spencer, and this is even harder, Janelle Monet, as these three women uh, mathematicians. But they look good, and they must have done the work. So good of Ms. Shetterly and of the film's producers who include Pharrell Williams, who's written the music, so it must be 
pretty good, uh, for telling the story. But even more good on Katherine Johnson and Dorothy Vaughn and Mary Jackson, the black women mathematicians who wrote this long overlooked chapter in our history and who now will be names that we will know and will celebrate. I wonder who among you will write your generation's chapter. So, we have come a long way, but we are constantly reminded that our journey is far from over. I'm talking of the persistent underrepresentation of women and people of color in the STEM professions. I quote, despite a national focus on directing more students towards science, technology, engineering, and math, particularly women and minorities, U.S. News and World Report reported last year, the STEM workforce is no more diverse now than it was in 2001. We still need more people who will break down these barriers. But I am also talking about the attitudes among people who should know better that allow underrepresentation to persist. Just last year, as the U.S. Supreme Court heard oral arguments on the race conscious admissions case of Fisher versus the University of Texas, the Chief Justice of the United States, John Roberts, posed a question, and I quote, what unique perspective does a minority student bring to a phys physics class, question mark, he asked. I'm just wondering what the, the benefits of diversity are in that situation, close quote. The Chief Justice's remark got the attention of Jedida C. Isler, a Vanderbilt University astrophysicist and a degree holder from two historically black colleges. As a black woman and an astrophysicist, Dr. Isler wrote the following week in the New York Times, I immediately became defensive of my own worthiness and that of the black students I mentor and support every day. The classroom, she wrote, is the door through which we create new physicists. Closing that door to students of color unless they can justify their presence is closing the door to the kinds of creativity that can be shown only after a student has mastered basic skills. The decision of high achieving STEM students of color and women like you to devote your careers to researching solutions to the barriers to longer and better lives for people around the world or to giving the next generation of STEM students the education they need is an answer to the Chief Justice's question. It will open the door still wider. And it can change the world to you, to the millions and even billions who can benefit from the career on which you are about to embark, your choice of that path to borrow from Robert Frost makes all the difference. I hope you will be intentional. I hope you will be strategic. I hope you will consider what is in your absolute best interest. And as you consider that, you'll consider how can you have the most impact on the world? How can you make the biggest difference? And if it is in that laboratory or in that enterprise that is based on STEM, then I'm telling you, pursue it. Work with all the energy and devotion and persistence and determination that you have within you. And if you do, you will make a difference. And if you choose Emory, you will be embraced, you will be welcomed, you will be nurtured, you will be challenged, you will work very hard. But you'll leave here 
with the degree and the skills to have a powerful, productive, and impactful life. It's your choice.